The world of Elden Ring is one of deep mystery. It's full of fantastical aspects that more often than not simply get written off as either too difficult to explain or not worth the effort. But over the past year, we've been making an attempt to dive into many of Elden Ring's biggest questions and explore the weirder side of the lore. And today we're going to be taking the plunge into Elden Ring's oceans. Because believe it or not, there is a lot here that's barely even been given a parting glance. But when analyzed with an investigative eye, not only helps us understand the story and world of the game better, but may also give us a glimpse into the future and the direction the DLC could take us. So today we're going to be breaking all of that down and trust me, this is going to get very interesting. But if you enjoy these lore deep dives and want to stay up to date on all things Elden Ring and From Software, then go ahead and hit that subscribe button and help the channel get to 100k. But with all that, let's get into it. To begin our discussion today, we have to go way back. Back before Elden Ring even released. Some of y'all might remember back in the lead up to Elden Ring, when the marketing was finally getting into full swing, many of us were lucky enough to get hands on with the game and play the closed network test. And in this network test, things were very different than the final release. Ever jail bosses were in different places and almost none of the items remained the same. And many of the item descriptions were also changed from then to now. But one of the biggest things that changed and one of the main mysteries we were trying to uncover back then was with the game's map. Now, if you actually take a look at the map from that build of the game, things aren't very different at all. In fact, it's almost exactly the same. But if you were playing this beta in China and decided to peruse through the game's files, then you would have found something very surprising. Here you can see the map of Limgrave and the Weeping Peninsula extracted from the Chinese network test. There are lots of major landmarks missing, and many of the key areas are undetailed and look entirely different. But the most fascinating part of all of this are the oceans, which are covered in various runes and decorated with the images of sea monsters. And after this was uncovered, the Chinese players got to work trying to translate these runes and discovered that they're actually ancient Yi script. But instead of directly translating to words, they instead translated to pronunciations, syllables which ended up creating Japanese words. And here are some of the translations. Off to the east of Limgrave, it says, Monster habitat, do not get close, with the image of a terrifying looking whale with two blowholes. Off to the east of the Weeping Peninsula, it says, Multiple witnesses to a sea serpent, danger and then a large octopus is shown beneath. Further above that, it says, do not listen to the songs of the lying mermaids. And then a very goofy looking sea serpent is also pictured. But what I found very interesting is that the original name for Limgrave in this text translates to something along the lines of Sea God Continent. Now, here's where we need to put up a bit of a disclaimer. Unfortunately, these sea monsters are not from Elden Ring. They're not original. What it seems like the developers did were take these from old medieval paintings and sea charts and decorate the map with them as a form of inspiration inspiration, because clearly this was never meant to be seen by the public. And we know this because many of the Yi labels for certain areas are either nonsensical or pulled straight from pop culture. And you might be wondering, well, if this was so early in development and never meant to be seen, then what's the point of even looking at it? Well, it goes a bit deeper. English data miners have also found evidence of these sea monsters in other versions of the map. This depiction here is still in the Elden Ring files and shows a very large sea serpent with a frilled back, among other creatures in the crater sea of the lands between below lake. Dell. This map has many of the modern details that were missing in the Chinese map and no longer has the script either. Also tucked away in the files of Elden Ring is the name of an unused NPC called Umibozu. Umibozu is a creature in Japanese folklore that appears in the Dark Seas. Umibozu translates to sea priest and are traditionally depicted as large silhouettes with glowing eyes that would appear out of the ocean and destroy ships. However, nothing besides the name of Umibozu appears in the Elden Ring files anymore. Now, as always when we discuss cut content, it's important to keep in mind that we can't use it as direct evidence for the final game. Instead, cut content should serve as a guide for themes and understanding of the developer's intention behind creating certain things. It shows us their thought process and what they were ultimately trying to communicate in the end. And when it comes to the oceans of Elden Ring, they are definitely meant to be sinister. So with that in mind, let's take a look at what we have in the final game. If you decide to go on a stroll along any of Elden Ring's beaches, you'll find them littered with driftwood and wreckage. And oftentimes you'll find abandoned and wrecked passenger boats as well. Although we don't have access to all of the beaches in Elden Ring, the ones we can find are all covered in debris, suggesting that the ships crashed in all parts of Elden Ring's sea. The largest vessel can be seen off the coast of Redon's arena. And the fact that it's suspended above the water like that suggests it ran aground in shallow waters. But along the beach in the same area, we can find many passenger boats that 
actually made it to shore, but at this time are equally damaged and destroyed. But before we talk about what might have caused the destruction, let's talk about who their passengers might have been. There are virtually no mentions of sea travel in the lore of Elden Ring, but there is one big event in the lore that would have involved such an endeavor. In Elden Ring's historical timeline, after the Tarnished lost their grace for the first time, they were banished across the sea to wage war in the Badlands. And this long march was led by Godfrey and is what we can see depicted in this popular image that shows him standing in the ocean. This is why the opening cutscene depicts the Tarnished all dead, because the events of the game immediately begin after they receive their grace and are called back to the lands between. But as for explicitly stating crossing the sea, there's only one time that's mentioned. Everyone's been grafted. Everyone who came with me, they crossed the sea for me, they fought for me, <laughs> only to have their arms taken, their legs taken, even their heads taken, taken and stuck to the spider. If you explore Morn Tunnel and defeat the Misbegotten at the end, you'll be rewarded with a weapon that describes the long march and how the transportation took place. The rusted anchor has a description that reads, While the Tarnished left the lands between with their lord, one boat alone was said to have been left behind. Now as to which boat this was, we really don't know. But another thing we really don't know is when Elden Ring's map was created, from a lore standpoint, because it depicts many ships, both coming and going from the lands between. We see a wide range of vessels, like rowboats and cargo ships, such as the more decorated ones that are still intact off the coast of Lane Dell. These ships are a big mystery to me because it suggests one of two things. The cargo ships could be a sign of a time when the land was open for trade, but the many rowboats that we can see in suggest something else, that people are willing to brave the seas in such small boats to either reach or get away from that land. But speaking of braving the seas, let's take a look at the water patterns. This map is full of abnormal currents and whirlpools, hardly fit for anyone to travel on, but the fact that it's depicted on this map suggests that it would have been common knowledge to the people at this time, and yet still they chose to travel on it. But you'll never notice these things when looking out from the shore. On the surface, it looks like a standard ocean, except for one part. Connecting Kaelid and the mountaintops of the giants is a massive waterfall, one that we can see when journeying there for ourselves. It's incredibly unusual and perfectly linear, running all the way from Kaelid to the mountaintops, and we see a whirlpool right at the top of it. It's just another reason why the ocean in Elden Ring is incredibly strange. But let's switch gears for a minute and turn our eyes from the ocean to water in general, because water is a major theme in one of Elden Ring's primary aspects of lore, and that is the world of the dead. The first and most primary element of aquatic imagery in association with the dead is of course Godwin, the Prince of Death himself, who after being slain with a form of cursed death, took on the lower half of a fish like a mermaid and developed a malformed head like an oyster. It's a very direct connection suggesting that this improper death is associated with the elements of the ocean. We then have the basilisk who spread the curse of death themselves and also bear aquatic features with a scaly hide, fins running along their spine, and a fin tail meant for things that swim. Another interesting use of aquatic imagery are the jellyfish, and we know from the item descriptions that the jellyfish are spirits of people who have since died, although it's never explicitly stated how one spirit becomes a jellyfish. Another clear example are the tibia mariners, who glide around the land on a boat and are said to be the guides of those lost in death. And they're perhaps the most interesting about all of this, because it makes you ask the question of why would the dead need a guide on a boat, and why would they need to be guided through water? Well, one thing you'll notice about Deathroot and the spreading of the curse is that it affects the surrounding water. And we can see in the story trailer that when Godwin is cursed, it exits his eye as water. Here next to the corpse of Godwin where the curse is the strongest, the water has taken on a purple color. But as that same cursed water flows elsewhere, it becomes a milky white. And you can see the same hue of water in areas affected by the Deathroot where the Tibia Mariners reside. And it can only be found in places associated with that curse. This connection is also reinforced by our spectral steed, who's named Torrent, a word that means a great flow of water. And Torrent is able to bridge the gap between the real world and the world of the spirits. And it is also worth noting that in the mountaintops of the giants, a land represented by ice and frozen water, we can find many spirits running around above the ground. But this is muddied by the fact that there are lots of aspects of spirits in Elden Ring that don't have any connections to water whatsoever. But given that in the DLC image we can see lots of these spirit graves, hinting at a 
connection with those who live in death, and that the tree in the background has so many similarities to death root, I can't help but feel like water in the ocean is going to play a major part in that. A personal theory that I've expressed many times here on the channel is that the DLC is going to take place either in the spirit world or the world of the dead, and I don't think it would be a far-fetched idea that based off the imagery we've shown so far, that we may have to pass through some sort of water to get there. I couldn't help but notice the sheer lack of aquatic bosses in the main game of Elden Ring, and for them to place such emphasis on the dangers of the ocean, especially early in the concept, I could definitely see them taking those ideas and implementing them in the DLC, whether it be in the form of those sea monsters we discussed earlier, or even in Umibozu. But I do have to say, if the land octopus is anything to go off of what an Elden Ring sea monster would look like, or what horrors lurk down in its oceans, then they would make some pretty awesome boss fights. The Elden Beast was pretty close to this, with the fight taking place on a body of water, and the Elden Beast mainly swimming around, but beyond being a pretty spectacle, it didn't dive into that theme whatsoever, and the same was true for the fight with Renala. There's seemingly no reason for this to take place on water. My point here is that the foundation is laid tremendously for not only some sea monster boss fights, but for the theme of the deep to be fully realized, and I definitely think it's something they'll lean into. Anyways though guys, that's gonna pretty much do it for the video today. Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below. Do you think the deep is something we're gonna dive into in Elden Ring's DLC? Or do you think all this imagery is just a coincidence? Also, let me know what other lore topics you'd like to see get explored. But aside from that, if you enjoyed the video, be sure to leave a like on it and subscribe if you're new around here. And with all that, I will catch you in the next one.